as I prepare to read this text that I couldn't really, I didn't really have time to say everything that needed to be said in this half an hour we're going to spend in this text, which is why I've kind of woven these things through the rest of the service. So if I don't happen to mention something I mentioned earlier again in the sermon, don't think that's because it doesn't apply. I just don't have the, the time. As I read this text, I do want you to notice that the author to the Hebrews is representing the Old Covenant almost as a purely legalistic covenant where God gave them the law and they didn't obey, so God, as it were, puts that covenant away and He makes a new covenant. We, we are not to understand by how it's represented in here that there was nobody in the Old Covenant that loved the Lord. There was nobody who found Christ. There was nobody who had, you know, who had the law written on their hearts. That was not the case. There were by God's grace. So understanding that, though, let's understand how the author actually does represent this covenant, and he draws a very stark contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant. And thank the Lord we are under that new covenant. So let me read um, Hebrews chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 13. But we're only going to be looking primarily at verse 10. We're, we're going to look at parts of this. Um, but that's the main point, the fact that God has taken these laws and written them, or He's put them in our minds and He's written them on our hearts. So this is what the author to the Hebrews writes. He says, now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, um, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the temple, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Now let me just mention two things again before we get into this. The first one is, even though this covenant is made with Israel, it still has to do with, with us because Jesus came, he ministered to Israel. There were those among Israel that believed him. They entered into the new covenant. And then when Israel, of course, rejected the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and put him to death, uh, even though God still went first to the Jews, he also, when they rejected, went to the Gentiles. And God is making a church made up of Jews and Gentiles. So the fact that this covenant was made with Israel does not mean it's not for the church. It doesn't mean it's not for us. It's talking about what we enjoy now. Secondly, the author to the Hebrews is writing at a time when the old covenant system was still standing, but it was right on the eve of its destruction. So when he says it's obsolete because what Jesus did rendered it obsolete. 
but now it's ready to disappear. That is, God is about to bring judgment upon Israel for the rejection of the Messiah. He's going to destroy the temple and put a final end to the old covenant system. But what we're interested in this morning, of course, is the new covenant. Now, the author to the Hebrews reminds us in our passage that God made a covenant at Sinai with his people when he brought them out of Egypt, and we call that, of course, the Mosaic Covenant. But he also reminds us that it was faulty. If it hadn't been faulty, the Lord would have left it in force, but he didn't. He didn't keep things the way they were. But notice specifically that the problem wasn't with the covenant. The problem was with the people, with God's people. They were the ones who did not continue in the covenant. They did not obey God. And that's because knowing the standard, and God writes it on the, on the, on the tablets of stone, and he says, here, this is what I want you to do. Knowing what you're supposed to do wasn't enough. They needed something more. They needed a change of heart. Now, the reason God gave them this covenant in the first place, as I mentioned earlier, was to show them that they needed a change of heart. It was to teach them about the hardness of their heart and the fact that they couldn't please God on their own and that they needed something more. They needed a savior. It was to show them that they really didn't love God and that they did not love their neighbor as they should. Now that's what the commandments do. They show us the sin in our hearts. They show us how hard our hearts really are. Now the reason the Lord wants us to see this is so that we also will look for something better. Something which the Lord has already provided for us. I mentioned before, when God enacted the Mosaic Covenant, when he brought the people of Israel out of Egypt and he made this covenant with them at Sinai, there was already a covenant in force called the Abrahamic Covenant that promised a seed, the seed of Abraham through, through which all the nations of the earth would be blessed. The purpose of the law was to drive the people of God to that promise, to that promised Messiah, to that promised seed. The same one, of course, who has come and has lived and has died so that we might have life. The law of God is meant to drive us to look for that seed, to look for King David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has the ability to take away our sins and to break the hardness of our hearts and to give us the power to love God and to follow him. Now, the author to the Hebrews tells us that through Jesus, God made a new covenant, one that is better than the first. And in this covenant, instead of writing his law again on stone tablets that could only remind us of our problem but not solve our problem, he solved the problem. He put these laws in our minds and he wrote them on our hearts. He gave us the power to obey them. He gave us the power of love. By the way, the same love that our Lord Jesus Christ had and has. Now, along with this change of nature, the author to the Hebrews also tells us that he has changed our relationship with God. God is no longer our judge. He no longer condemns us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes our father. He becomes a very loving father who will make sure that none of his children perish. And we are no longer at war with him, which is what we were before, but now he adopts us into his family as sons and daughters. And as sons and daughters, with our changed nature, what we want to do now is, is only to honor him. Now, if we ask the question, why were these men that we looked at over the past you know, five Sunday evenings, why did they do what they did? Why did they live the life that they lived? Well, it's because of this. This is why John Knox risked his life to see the Church of Scotland become something that would honor and glorify God, that it would be, the term is reformed, according to his word, that it would conform to his word, because this is what honors God. That's why John Bunyan was willing to go and preach the gospel in a place where 
He was even warned ahead of time that he would be arrested if he did, but his desire to honor the Lord was greater. This is why John Newton devoted his life to preaching and writing hymns about the grace of God, that he is willing to save even the the very worst of sinners if they will simply turn from their sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why Charles Spurgeon devoted all of his powers, and they were tremendous, his energies, his oratory, his photographic memory, his talents, his resources to proclaim the good news about what God has done through Jesus Christ. And this is also how Eric Little was able so easily to give up the honors of this world and go to a foreign land in order to share the gospel. It's because they had a new nature. It's because God had put his laws in their minds. He had written them on, on their hearts. It's because they had this new relationship with the Lord. They had become his sons. They were no longer the sons of the world. Now they were sons of God. It's because now their only concern was to honor the one who had saved them from their sins, the one who loved them first. Remember, we love because he first loved us. Now, last week we were reminded that we're all called to run in a race, the same race that these men ran, one that requires us to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, to remember him, to remember what it is he did to save us, how he obeyed for us, how he laid down his life, he died for us, to remember his promise. Remember, he's not only the author of our faith, but he is also the finisher. He is the one who has promised that if we will simply trust in him, he will bring it to its completion. And we are to look to Jesus for his example that we may follow it. Looking to Jesus, but also remembering that this race requires us to put aside everything that gets in our way, especially the sin that so easily trips us up because it is contrary to what the Lord wants us to do. It is contrary to to progress. Literally, in, in, a, in a physical sense, what this would look like is people on the starting line of a race trying to run the race all tied up or with, weighted with weights. Sometimes that's how we attempt to run the Christian life, but we, we cannot run the race this way. If we're going to make any progress, we have to put these things aside and to fix our eyes on Jesus. We were reminded that to run this race To compete in this race, we must compete according to the rules. But what are these rules? What is the standard we should compare our lives with so that we can know what we are to lay aside? Now, I mentioned before, we live in a world that is saturated with immorality, and that immorality is encroaching upon us, and we're beginning to live with it, accept it, uh, maybe even see it as normal, but if that's what's happening, we're already losing sight of the standard. We need to stay in the Word of God. This standard is the same rule, the same law that God has put in our minds, the one He has written upon our hearts. In the new covenant, it is the law of God, the writing of that law in our hearts by His Spirit that gives us not only the power to keep it, but it is the standard, it is the same Standard. Now, what I'd like us to do this morning is consider how the law of God basically works in the new covenant, what it is, and how, you know, what, what the differences are between at least what the author to the Hebrews points out between what it was like under the old covenant and what it's like under the new covenant. And ultimately, I want us to take a good look at our lives and to measure them, to measure the love that we have for the Lord by the commandments because they show us how to love the Lord and how we keep them shows us how much we actually love Him. So what I want us to look at are basically three things. First of all, that the law that God wrote on stone in the Old Covenant is the same law that He writes in our hearts in the New Covenant. Secondly, that what He requires in the New Covenant is the same But our motive for keeping it is different, and here's where we need to be a little bit careful because that's not the way it was for all the Old Covenant people of God. 
There were believers who kept it for the same reason that we would keep it, but the vast majority of them didn't, and that's why they failed. And then thirdly, since love is what moves us now to obey God's law, we should know that we can measure our love by our obedience. So let's consider, first of all, that the law that he wrote on stone in the Old Covenant is the same law that he has written on our hearts in the new. Now, contrary to what many today in the broad church believe, God's moral really have, has not changed. His standard has not changed. It is the same. The Lord tells us that there was nothing wrong with the standard that was in the Old Covenant. The problem was not with the standard. It did what it was supposed to do. It was to teach us about love, how to love God and how to love our neighbor. Remember, the fulfillment of the law is love. But it also, at the same time, showed God's people that they didn't love God and they didn't love their neighbor as they should. But the problem was not with the standard. It was not with the law. It was perfect. The problem was that God's people didn't want to obey that standard. The fault was with them and not with the covenant. Now notice what the author to the Hebrews writes in verse 9. They did not continue in my covenant. They didn't. And I did not care for them, says the Lord. The reason why God made the new covenant was to fix the problem, the obedience problem that existed in the old covenant. The way he did this was by giving us his son and through his son's work by sending the spirit into our hearts. He reversed our situation from what it says in verse 9. They did not continue in my covenant and I did not care for them. Two, verse 10. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the way he did this was through this new work in verse 10. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts. He took the law which was written in stone and he wrote that law in our hearts so that we would want to obey it. Now again, you understand it's not literally written on, the, on the, our fleshly hearts. But the Spirit of God has come into our souls, into our affections, and He has changed them. And He has given us a love for the law, which is written on the stone. So the idea is He gives to us the desire to keep that law. Now Paul, as I mentioned before, tells us the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. He says, you are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Now what Paul is saying here is that as believers, we are like so many letters, although in this case we are living letters written by Jesus Christ, written by His Spirit on our hearts, sent to the world so that the world may see the changes that He has made in us, that they might see Jesus living in us, His love coming from us, a love that is defined by the law. And the reason why Jesus wrote us as letters, wrote the law in our hearts and sent us to the world was so that they would know that He is real. You know, the greatest testimony, the greatest testimony that God gives of His reality and the truth of the gospel is the way that His people live, which is why we are supposed to live as lights in the world and not put our lights under bushels. We are to live openly as Christians. Now, Paul tells us that this is ultimately why God chose us in the first place, was that we might become like Jesus, who is, again, his perfect image. In his image, not in the sense that when we see what Jesus looked like, we know what God looks like, because God is the Spirit and he's invisible. But when we see Jesus, we see the nature of God. We see his character. We see his morality. Well, God chose us 
to become like Jesus. That was a part of his plan. That's why he predestined us. He writes in Romans 8, verse 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, notice, to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he, that is Jesus, the Son, would be the firstborn among many brethren. That is, he would be the first among many who were just like him. Now, Paul doesn't mean here that we're going to become like him only when we finally get to heaven. Jesus is glorified and he, he has a sort of radiance and glory coming from him. And when we get there, we'll have perfect bodies and we'll also sort of shine with glory. That, that is true. That's going to happen. But what he means here also is that his character is being formed in us right now as he is preparing us to live with him forever in heaven. If that weren't true, we wouldn't be letters sent to the world. They would look at us and they'd see absolutely no difference. But that's not how the Lord intends it. He intends for them to see that we are now new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the new covenant, God is changing us into the image of his Son. He's working from the inside to change the outside. As Jesus said to the Pharisees on one occasion, you clean up the outside. You know, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. Outside you appear beautiful to men, but inside you're full of corruption. Well, that's a recipe for hypocrisy. Clean up the outside, but inside be corrupt. No, what the Lord does is he comes into the inside and he changes the inside, he changes the heart, and then the outside conforms to what's on the inside. That's not hypocrisy. That's, that's purity. That's reality. That's that's the grace of God transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. That is, is truth. Now, he's changing us from the inside so that we will become like Jesus, so we'll think like Jesus, so we will live like Jesus lived, so that we will live according to the same standard by which Jesus lived. And what is the standard that Jesus lived by? Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew 5.17, he says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now, that certainly means that he came to fulfill prophecy regarding himself. He was going to fulfill everything that had to do with the Messiah. But he says he came to fulfill the law as well. In other words, he came to obey it so that he might be able to give to us that perfect record of obedience. Well, Jesus then calls us to live by that same standard by which he lived. He reminds us, or he continues in verse 19 of Matthew chapter 5. And here he is speaking to his disciples. And of course, whatever he says to his disciples also applies to us, at least according to our gifts and our calling in life. But he says this, Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus did not come to change the standard. He came to fulfill it so that we would be able to do it. He says in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 5, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest stroke, letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And all being accomplished is not Jesus having fulfilled it all, but it means until everything God has planned has come to pass. The standard of morality is always going to be the same. Jesus came to give us the Spirit so that we might keep this standard. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, notice, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And he's not talking here about the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ here. He's not saying that Jesus came so that we can just be credited as, righteousness, as righteous, but we can still live the same way 
we used to live. But what he's saying is the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us by the Spirit of God who gives us the love for the law and the ability to submit to it because that's what we want now to do. In the new covenant, God fixes the problem. Under the old covenant, the problem was not with the standard. The standard must always be the same. I mean, how can you change it? The standard is this. When Jesus was asked to summarize everything that was in the law and the prophets, this was his summary. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says on these two depend all the law and the prophets. That's what Jesus came to fulfill. That's what he did to earn us a perfect righteousness. But he also came to give us the ability to do exactly this because this was the problem. We were rebels against God. We didn't love God or our neighbor. We loved ourselves and we were going to do what we wanted to do. But Jesus comes and he changes all of that. And he gives us now the ability to love God and to love our neighbor. The problem was with our hearts, but he has fixed the problem. So the blessing of the new covenant is not simply that Jesus has taken away all of our guilt, although he has, and we need to be thankful for that because that guilt would have condemned us forever in hell. But there's another part of the new covenant blessing. The other part is he has broken the power of sin in our hearts so that we no longer have to obey it. Now we can obey the law of God. We are free, with, not with regard to righteousness, but free with regard to sin. Now we are, we might say, bound by righteousness, but this is a kind of a binding or a slavery or a servitude that we want. We want to be bound to love God. We want to be bound to love our neighbor because that is where our hearts are now. That is what Jesus has done for us. So that law is the same standard. The standard hasn't changed. You know, different theories have come up in the history of the church as to what Jesus did. Some say he did away with the law and he gave us a new law. The new law is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's the only one you have to obey. And if you do it, you're saved. A lot of churches actually look at things that way today and they take the law of God and they just cast it aside. But that's not the case. The the reality is Jesus has given us the ability to do what we could not do, love God and love our neighbor. Okay, now let's get to the second point. Secondly, though what he requires in the new covenant is the same, clearly our motive in keeping this requirement is different. Now I already hedged on what I was just about to say, that there are again many in the broad church today who not only believe that the standard has changed, they also believe that for God to require any standard is to destroy the gospel, the gospel of free grace. They say salvation can't be by grace alone through faith alone and at the same time require obedience because we are saying God still requires obedience. It's just in the new covenant he's given us the ability to do it. Now it is true that it would be a contradiction to say that salvation is a free gift, but it's also something that we have to earn. But that is not what God says, and that's not what we are saying. What we're saying is this, salvation or justification, being declared righteous by God, good enough to enter into heaven, is free. It's a free gift given purely by God's grace. And we receive it by faith alone, so that it may be by grace alone. We look to Jesus Christ and we receive it and we are saved. We don't earn anything by our obedience. And if we believe that we do, that is legalism. But it is still true, on the other hand, that God in the new covenant requires obedience. He requires the same obedience that he required under the old covenant. I should have modified that. We don't have to keep the ceremonial law. And the civil law basically doesn't exist because that particular situation doesn't exist any longer. I'm talking about the moral law. God still requires the same moral obedience, the same morality that he required in the old. So what is the difference between that and legalism? Well, the difference is that our obedience under the new covenant is also a gift 
of God's grace. It is the result of God's grace. We've just seen that Jesus came in the new covenant to fix the problem in the old covenant, and the problem was we didn't obey because we didn't love. But now, by His grace, we do obey because now we do love. There's a big difference between legalism and what we call you know, evangelical obedience, obedience to the Lord Jesus because He saved us. Legalism says, Galatians 3.12, he who practices them shall live by them. If, you're, if you want life, keep the commandments. It says in verse 10, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. That is legalism. You try to be saved by the law, all you can do is be cursed by the law. But the obedience Jesus gives us in the new covenant basically says this, Psalm 86, 11, Teach me. Your way, O oh Lord, I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. It says in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. In the new covenant, we obey because we love, because we love God. We obey the law because it shows us how to love God and how to love our neighbor in a way that is pleasing God or that, that pleases Him. Legalism is an obedience that looks for payment. New covenant, evangelical obedience is doing what's right because it's right, because we want to do what's right. This is the change that takes place when God puts His laws in our minds and writes them on our hearts, is that we do it because that's our new nature. We want to do it. We, it's our desire. You know, certain people like certain things and they don't like other certain things. We came into the world not liking God's law, so we didn't do it. But the Lord changes our taste, our appetite to desire His law. And so now we automatically do it. And we don't do it saying, if I just work hard enough, God will have mercy on me and save me. But it says, thank you, Lord, for having mercy on me. Thank you for saving me and thank you for changing my heart so that now I want to do what I should have done in the first place but didn't want to do. Thank you for having mercy on me. Now this doesn't mean that we're never going to struggle to obey. It doesn't mean that we don't have to fear the Lord, that we don't have to think about the possibility that He might discipline us. Sometimes our love is going to be so weak that that may be all that we have to motivate us is the fear of the Lord and maybe the, the rod of His discipline hanging over our head. But in the new covenant, the main motivation for our service to the Lord will be love. So the rule has not changed, but God has changed our motivation for keeping it. It's no longer for fear of judgment and damnation because He saved us from that. Now it's out of love and thankfulness that God has saved us and because He's changed our hearts and we desire to do the law. Now the final point is this. Since love under the new covenant is what moves us to obey God's law, we should be able to measure our love by our obedience. How much do you love the Lord? Well, you can tell by how much you obey the Lord. I mean, how can we know that we love the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus actually tells us we can know if we obey Him. Basically, we've just seen all of that, but Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. How can you know that you love Jesus? If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. But how can we measure the strength of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we can only do it by the strength of our obedience. I think oftentimes we measure our love by what we feel in our hearts, where our hearts feel warm, our chest feels full, and we have warm thoughts of Jesus, we say, I love Jesus, and I love Him more today than I loved Him yesterday. But what if yesterday I obeyed Him more than I obeyed Him today? Which day did I actually love Him more on? Well, 
It would have to be the day in which we actually obeyed the Lord more because that's what our Lord tells us. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't feel love. Our obedience needs to grow from the affection that is in our hearts for the Lord. But the stronger that affection is, if it's real affection and real love, the Lord says it's going to show itself in our obedience. Feeling without obedience is not the love that the Lord is looking for. It's not the love that He has actually come to bring us. He is bringing us or has brought us a love that actually works itself out in submission or obedience to the commandments of God and actually loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. If we love Jesus, we'll obey Him. The more we love Him, the more we will obey Him. As Jesus said on one occasion, although changing the words a little bit, the one who loves much will do much. The one who loves little will do little. Now let me also mention that if, if we have a strong love for our Lord Jesus, it's also going to make us more careful to do what we know is pleasing to Him. And how do we know what's pleasing to Him? Well, the commandments tell us. They, they were written to show us what is pleasing to Him, what He considers acts of love towards Him, what He considers as acts of love toward our neighbor, He has shown us in the commandments. So if we have a strong love for the Lord, we'll also look more carefully at the commandments to understand what it is that He actually is telling us to do here. In other words, we won't be content with just sort of a general understanding, I, I think this is what God wants. This is what I believe he wants. I'm just going to do what I think is right. I'm not really going to look. No, we're, we're going to look, you see. We're going to look and we're going to study. We won't reject anything that God says, no matter how difficult it is. Sometimes we don't want to look because we think it's going to be too hard. I'll just stay in my ignorance, and as long as I'm ignorant, God will excuse me. Well, it doesn't actually work that way, does it? because God still holds us accountable and He will help us to see. If we belong to Him, He will make sure that we see and that we do what it is that He calls us to do and life's not going to go terribly well until we do. That's the discipline of the Lord. He will lead us in that direction. You know, the Puritans were criticized for being too precise. John Rogers, I told you the story before, was once on horseback riding past this particular uh, landowner, the landowner saw him and he came out and rode alongside of him and he started giving him a hard time. And he said, why are you so picky? Why are you so particular? Why do you scrutinize everything so much? Why are you spending so much time and preaching so much that we need to live this exact way? Why? You're, you're, you're kind of a nice guy. I like you. But I think you're too picky. Well, John Rogers said this, the reason that I live this way is because the God I serve is very precise in what it is that He wants me to do. I serve a precise God. Now you read the Bible and you tell me whether or not God is very particular in what He tells us that He wants us to do. You know, you might say that walking the path God wants us to walk is a very narrow path. It's like a razor's edge in some senses. Uh, there isn't a lot of room to fudge, as it were. You get too far one, one way, you go off the path, too far the other. Again, John Bunyan in his book, Pilgrim's Progress, represented as that straight and narrow path, which Jesus said leads to life, and there are only few who actually are walking on it. And I do believe that means Jesus being the only way, but it also means we'll live the way he calls us to live. It's a path that leads to life. It's very narrow. God is very particular in what He calls us to do and how He calls us to live. But you see, if we love Him, then we're going to want to know exactly what it is that He tells us, what it is He wants us to do so that we will do it. Not because if we don't, we'll be condemned, but because we love Him and want to please Him. Now, that again is why I believe Eric Little was so was able so easily to turn his back on the gold medal, on the honors that this world would have given him, you know, running his best event on the Lord's Day. And we, we talked about this, I think it was this past Wednesday, we were talking about spiritual warfare and how the devil works. I'm sure the devil was suggesting to Eric Little that 
you know what, Eric? Why don't you just run on Sunday, win that medal, and it'll give you a great opportunity to share the gospel with others. You see, here's a good thing that can come out of this, this disobedience. Well, Eric said, no. God says, this day is for him. I'm going to worship him. I'm not even going to attempt to run for that medal. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. And so what, what did the Lord do instead? The Lord showed him that he could run in another event on another day in the 400, an event where he was only mediocre, although a contender, but not really a prize contender. And he allowed him to run that race more strongly than he'd ever run in his life. And he set a world record that lasted for 12 years in a race that he wasn't even well trained for. Those who honor God, God will honor. How, he, how was he able then to move from, you know, as you saw in the documentary, a picture of him on the backs of all of his students and contemporaries as they're heralding him, carrying him through the streets, this is our champion and so forth. How was he able to turn his back on the honors that would have been his as an athlete, which um, Harold Abraham certainly cashed in on after the Olympics, and go to China and do that very difficult work of bringing the gospel to the Chinese? How was he able to do these things? Well, the secret to his obedience, again, was the blessing of the new covenant, his love for God. The only choice, as far as he was concerned, was to choose what would please his Lord, and that is what he knew would please him. Now, if we love him, that's what we're going to want to do as well. Make those choices that are pleasing to the Lord. So for the next few weeks, I thought we would look at the commandments, but look at them from the perspective that God wants us to see them, not as a, as a uh, you know, the, well, as Moses is portrayed in Pilgrim's Progress, as, as something that can only slam down on us and condemn us and push us into the ground. You remember Moses came up on faithful and started wailing away at him and almost finished him off until Jesus came and told Moses to leave him alone. <laughs> But Moses was not like that, but Moses was a picture of, of the commandments that can only condemn. When faithful says, have mercy, he goes, I don't know how to show mercy, and he, he nails him again, and he says he was about to finish him off when, when Jesus comes by and, and says, let him alone. Well, that's, again, that's how we don't want to look at the commandments, unless, of course, you're outside of Christ. That's what the commandments still say to you. They still tell you that they're going to finish you. It's not the commandments, but it's your sin that's going to finish you if you don't repent and turn to Jesus. But when you turn to Jesus, that relationship changes, and now it's become the standard of how I love the Lord and how I love my neighbor, and I do it because I want to do it, and I want to please the Lord. My motivation is entirely different. That's how we're going to look at it. How is this loving the Lord? How is this loving our neighbor? How can we learn more about how to please God in loving Him more and loving others more? Now, in closing, let me just simply say this, that the Lord hasn't yet written His law on your hearts because only He can do that. He's the author. He has to write it by His Spirit. He has to give the Spirit. I would encourage you to look to Jesus this morning for Him to do that work that He can do, that He might change your hearts that he might turn you into a living letter that could be known and read by all men. The way you do that is you turn from your sins. You trust Jesus alone and you look to him to provide everything that you need that you might run the race to its end. Again, I would remind you, God would have never put his son through such misery, such agony. If there were many ways to come to God, he wouldn't have put his son to death. This is the only way. Jesus is the only way. You must look to him. And if you do, it basically shows that he's already written his law in your hearts by his Holy Spirit. He's opened your eyes. He's raised you to life so that you can see and you can trust in him. If you haven't trusted Jesus, look to him this morning for his life and his salvation. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to... Take his word and apply it to our hearts.